would say my you know, one piece of advice is very much related to the way that I've kind of done things as well. And it comes to this aspect of being an ever learning student, I guess you could say, as you're building things. I think that would be a huge piece of advice. And what that relates to is like, what are the major books in my field or in this industry? What are the different webinars that I can kind of attend? What are the different YouTube videos I can educate myself? Like, I'm almost constantly... Uh, I mean, I even went through a, a phase actually of a of a year, a full a year and a bit, where I actually didn't watch any movies or TV shows. It was all documentaries. It was all YouTube educational content. My YouTube hours have got to be crazy. Like the amount of like educational content on YouTube is insane. And so, like, just to be able to constantly be updating and improving yourself uh, as an ever learning student, despite being of already graduated. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups in the seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great uh, guest on the podcast, uh, Dan Rodman. And uh, Dan uh, started uh, his journey uh, securing a, a spot on the a soccer team in uh, British Columbia during college, um, studied in Canada, and then uh, moved to the U.S. and then getting an engineering degree, uh, and then went off to play uh, soccer in the EU for a bit of time, um, and then came back to the, the U.S. and did a, a few e-commerce businesses, and then uh, started a marketing agency on the side, uh, working as an engineer full-time during the meantime. Um, and then also uh, turned a house into an Airbnb for income and uh, to allow to, to travel with the business. Um, had a or found a co-founder to, to build communities for marketing uh, for businesses and has uh, been doing that for about uh, six months or so and also uh, continuing to do the Airbnb. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Dan. Yeah, I appreciate it, Devin. Super stoked to be here. I'm excited to have you on. So... Perfect. Well, uh, I gave kind of a, a quick uh, run through to a, a much longer journey, but uh, why don't we uh, rewind and unpack a little bit um, and tell us a little bit about uh, how your uh, journey got started uh, going off to, to play soccer uh, in uh, or in British Columbia, Columbia during college. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even I started a little bit even earlier, too, just to kind of give context for that. I, I grew up in a super small town in British Columbia, a little mountain town called Nelson and the Kootenays. It's about eight hours from Vancouver. So, you know, super lucky to have grown up playing around in the forest, having fun, all sorts of, you know, good nature and things like that. Mostly worried about, you know, wildlife and bears over over anything else in those types of areas, right? And so uh wasn't a lot of soccer in that small town. And so when I was 16, I actually ended up getting a spot on a team. It was like an academy team. And so I finished off high school in Vancouver and stayed with a homestay family. And um, and then that propped me up for going right into college in Vancouver, where I where I did engineering. And um, that first year engineering, basically, I played for the played for the college there as well. And I was really keen to to keep playing at a at a higher level while still kind of continuing education. And that's where then we looked. I looked at opportunities for seeing about college in the U.S. because there's a lot more competitive uh, soccer and uh and teams with some of the colleges down in the u.s and really good engineering schools and so to be able to find a place then down in tennessee and memphis where you know education was covered a lot by the athletic scholarship um and to still obviously be studying what you're kind of being interested in and whatnot uh it just made sense to make to make the right move um uh, but yeah do you have any so other you came to, thoughts came to on the canada go ahead. No, go ahead I was going to say, so you, so you came to the U.S. and, okay, you know, passion and uh, drive is still in the, the soccer arena. And, uh, you know, the U.S. Is a, has a, a bit uh, larger league and uh, more uh, opportunities there. and But uh, also continue to um, study during college now. Uh, walk, remind us, what uh, what did you study while you were in college or as you were uh, in tandem pursuing the, the soccer career? Yeah, so I, I got into mechanical engineering. Um, you know, I grew up, my dad's a civil engineer. And uh, and my grandpa was actually also a civil engineer, and 
So a little bit in the family history and, you know, I, I had a lot of fun with remote control cars and, and fixing up cars and things like that, even uh, drones, all sorts of that type of thing. When I was younger, flying remote control airplanes, all that type of stuff. So that kind of drove my interest for the mechanical side to build things, you know, and that's what kind of fueled the passion for, you know, mechanical engineering as, as a really good, at least career choice to, to move forward in. But ultimately, I realized I was just interested in a lot of different things, as as you can probably tell from some of the way my story went. <laughs> oh, it uh, sounds like it was a, a, a great, uh, great opportunity. So you got the engineering degree, you continued to play soccer. And if I remember right, kind of after you came out of uh, college, you went out, to, went off to Europe for a period of time and played uh, soccer a bit more professionally uh, before coming back to the U.S. Is that right? Yeah, I had a short little stint and an opportunity. Um, I was playing in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia on like this touring team. It was mostly a, a lot of uh, American players as well. And we were able to go into this league where we got to play against um, in this kind of professional Northern European circuit to see about getting placements for other teams. And so I did have an opportunity to go play for a team in Sweden. And uh, I had to make a decision between going back to the U S and starting my career as an engineer where, you know, pretty good salary starting as an engineer coming out of school and whatnot. And also would keep my U S visa valid or whether I was going to forfeit the ability to work in the U S as a Canadian and fully pursue kind of like chasing um, soccer in this lower division up in Northern Europe. And so ultimately I, I came back to, to start work, um, to start work as an engineer but uh, yeah, I mean, going through a college, I mean, before that, though, like I said, being interested in different things, that was when I started to play around with some of the e-commerce side of things with, you know, could I start a drop shipping, you know, website or web store to make some side income while I was in college, you know, because being, you know, doing, doing athletics and studying engineering um, didn't leave a lot of time for, for any sort of part-time job at all, right? So that was where I was sometimes in my spare time, it was like, what are the little side hustles you know that you can get into when you go down the side hustle route i mean as people might know in the entrepreneurial world i mean there's a hundred gurus and a hundred different like you know strategies and things to try when it comes to side hustles and making money so i definitely explored quite a few of those which was, was which was very fun interesting learning experiences for sure <laughs> No, sounds like it. And just to give us an idea, what were some of the different uh, e-commerce type of uh, stores or that that you the that uh, you set up or that you uh, that you pursued? So you probably see quite a bit of this. The people talking about like drop shipping and how you know the drop shipping model in certain senses is, is quite easy for you to set up because of the way that drop shipping works, where you don't have any of the merchandise or product yourself. When a, or when a customer makes an order on your website, you then fulfill the order through a partner and they ship it directly to the customer with your label or with your kind of product branding on it sometimes. And so I basically was trying to capitalize on certain trends. So Game of Thrones, that TV show was super popular um, at one point in time there when the first season came out was when I did a drop shipping store and I did jewelry. That was Game of Thrones jewelry and um, trying to really capitalize on you know, it being very, very popular and trendy as a TV show. And so, oh, like what are products people would search around that? And then ultimately I got into like playing with Facebook targeted ads put to the website to have people buy, you know, jewelry of some sorts that I was marketing and advertising for $10, $15, but I was fulfilling at a cost of like $4, right? So my profit margins in between there. Um, but ultimately spending money on Facebook ads is a, it was right as Facebook ads are getting more expensive. I know in the early days of Facebook, they were, they were cheaper and whatnot. So I think I ended up honestly um, coming out break even, if not negative, like it was so hard to like, you'd make some money on some sales and then you'd be losing money on all your time, effort and marketing. It was a tough one for me to crack while juggling other things, but that was just one of the little, little business ones that I was diving into. Yeah. No, makes sense. You know, and that's, it's, you know, sometimes when you get into e-commerce, you, 
can do well and it takes off. And a lot of times it's, you know, you see it online, you see all the ads, you think that all you need is a product and some Facebook ads and everything will work out. And then you, you learn that that's not always the case, but uh, you know, it sounds like you got some uh, good experience in that, uh, that arena nonetheless. And so, so now at the, at the time you're doing the, the drop shipping, was that kind of a, a full-time endeavor and that was the, the main focus or was that kind of splitting your time or kind of walk us through a bit as to, to what you were, you know, how you were, as you're having some wins and some losses, how you kind of uh, continue to, to support yourself. Yeah, no, I was definitely splitting time quite a bit. That was during college um, in the States. So I was still playing on the team, um, training quite a bit. Um, and then also obviously studying and doing engineering. And then a little bit as just like my own side interest of other things kind of that's where I kind of got into and that was also when I got into another um, interest of mine being with like stocks and investing and being you know obviously in college and not having a lot of income there wasn't a lot of like I didn't have a job salary that I could just consistently put into investing and so what I was kind of interested in was putting money into trading and so like how can I trade stocks and so I went down that big rabbit hole of contract options and options trading and like leveraging a little bit here and there and playing in that whole market space, which was a really other, you know, so many huge learning, you know, scenarios there, but at least, you know, I was playing with like, you know, a couple hundred dollars at a time. And so you could see how fast that would disappear when you're leveraged or when you're doing an options trade um, versus like, you know, just doing traditional investing dollar cost averaging and, and that type of thing. So I was definitely down a pretty big financial literacy route there while in college doing engineering just constantly kind of educating myself at the same time mm. on these different things uh for sure so now it makes sense so you, you go down that route and you, you do that so you uh got into you know e-commerce for a period of time you're we also doing uh, engineering and then i think at some point amid, amidst all of that you uh start doing a um marketing agency excuse me, as well as uh, doing some Airbnb and also uh, getting into travel a bit. So kind of uh, walk us through a, a bit of uh, how that evolved. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, another interesting uh, aspect that I think is a good opportunity for entrepreneurs to get into is, is another thing that I'm not sure if I mentioned when I first came back from Europe playing soccer after college um, and I mentioned I came back for my visa, I had to start a job that was in the engineering field within, I think it was like 10 days. Otherwise my visa would expire and I'd have to go through this whole big process. So I had to start a job that was in the engineering field in 10 days when I came back to the US. And what I did was there was a company called Vivint Smart Home and it was a smart home technology and security kind of company. They do like, like security cameras on people's houses, doorbell cameras, things like that. Mm. And um, they, they hired me as a, as a salesman, a door-to-door -door salesman, and they called me an engineer sales lead. And so it fulfilled like the role that I was an engineer. And it was just this temporary role that was full commission, zero dollars an hour, full commission. And uh, I was going door-to-door, -door, knocking on people's doors, trying to sell them these security systems. I already had my full engineering degree and I was interviewing for like a larger engineering job. But in the interim, to like have a little bit of income and also just to have uh keeping the visa valid to show that i was working as an engineer i basically had to i went through about a month and a half two months of doing door-to-door -door sales uh with a uh, smart home tech which was was super you know interesting learning experience because you are just knocking on random people's doors and then having to have a conversation with them and then talk them into buying something from you. So the communication skills I learned from that was huge. Like I got so much better at talking to people, learning, like recognizing, you know, emotional intelligence, their facial expressions, things they're leaning towards and things like that, uh, which ultimately helped me a lot. I think like that sales aspect in the different things and sales and marketing are very similar. You know, marketing is just, you're kind of able to do it at scale when it comes to what you're putting out there when it comes to advertising and copy and things like that. Um, so I think I got really, really interested in sales at that point too. And when I was doing the door-to-door -door sales, I started reading a bunch of different sales books, um, Way of the Wolf, uh, can't remember a couple of other ones. And that was just like helpful for me to understand 
like the sales perspective, I think honestly, I'd almost re recommend it to like younger entrepreneurs just to like find some company and go do like a summer door to door gig where you just for one summer knock on doors, knock on a hundred doors every day, and and talk to random people about something that you're selling. Just like the experience you get from that is uh is definitely um huge, and so when it comes to like more sustainable side hustles, I guess the model that I really learned that looked good for me was a marketing agency. And, and the reason why that came present to me was there's another entrepreneur uh, who I actually played college soccer with in Canada, that fun year that I played in Canada. His name is Dylan Van Az. He's the founder of a marketing agency called Monopolize. They're uh, like an eight figure agency based in Las Vegas. Now they have 150 employees, They've scaled massively. He's absolutely crushing it. And he's launched a platform called Agency Box, which is basically like it sounds like an agency in a box. It's a white labeling solution for marketing agencies where you're basically utilizing their team to fulfill certain services as an agency model. So I basically connected with him again, caught up with him, and he was just launching this new product, Agency Box. And so I basically was one of the first users, kind of beta users for it. And I had a, a marketing agency called Line Rise Marketing, where I did mostly PR and some social media growth. And so anytime, basically, I had a website that was oriented around doing PR and social media for Web3 and crypto. Um, when I was doing all the stock options trading I mentioned earlier, it led me into learning about crypto and, and starting to get into the whole crypto space. And so as I learned more about that space, I thought, okay, I could add value here by creating a marketing agency that's specific to fulfilling services in that in that space. And knowing Dylan and his uh, white labeling solution there with being agency box, I thought, you know what, let's look at, you know, providing value to this space with my knowledge um and create a custom tailored website for it and so yeah i had nfts got really crazy then there's lots of different projects popping up so the opportunities started to really be all over the place and i started to sell uh quite a few different deals um and how it would work is people would communicate with me and i would come up with exactly what they need and the strategy for how they write the article and everything and then i would have a separate team that i work with help me write the article i would edit it and then i would work with dylan's team to get it published um in like big articles like cryptonews.com we could even do articles even in forbes and really large publications and so i'd sell these different press packages uh, to these different company com companies mm. um mostly like i said in the web3 space and so you know that was that was really really uh interesting for a while and i think the marketing agency model is a interesting uh model to kind of look at scaling there's a lot of different issues that you have with it but um it was a fun thing to kind of get into for sure. Um, you have any questions on that before? Do you want me to dive into like how kind of how the Airbnb came into play? No, uh, yeah, that, no, that's a great walkthrough. But that, yeah, tell us now a little bit uh, how the, the Airbnb kind of mixed in, in or mixed in with that. If I remember when we chatted a bit, it was kind of, hey, as with a lot of businesses, you're getting the business up and going, you know, you're trying to preserve cash flow or to, to be able to fund that. And so I think if I remember right, you know, Airbnb and B kind of came into allow for a bit of the, the flexibility of um, be able to travel a bit more and also have that income flow as you were getting the, the market the agency up and going. Is that about right? Or kind of walk us through a little bit of, of kind of how that took place. Totally. Airbnb has been, a, it was a pretty big saving grace for me, you know, um, basically. So when I came back, like I mentioned from Europe there and, and started work, did the door to door stint for two months and then got into a really big uh, firm called mechanical uh, sorry called Bernhard mechanical they're a uh, mechanical engineering firm and so I was a project manager there working on big commercial construction projects so I did uh, the St. Jude Advanced Research Center in Memphis it was a three-year long project so I I know that building like the back of my hand all the mechanical systems the duct work the piping all that stuff and so that's what I learned in school and so it's just a really tough industry though to be honest commercial construction itself is pretty cutthroat when it comes to you know budgeting and it comes to you know you either have the general contractor who's representing the client kind of on your case about your schedule is not fast enough you're not moving fast enough you know um or you have your boss at your company bernhard mechanical saying you're spending too much money like we need to spend less money on labor you know all this stuff and it's like i need to spend money to go faster it's like who do i please you know and so 
it's a, it's a tough industry, right? And so I was doing the marketing agency, getting that started on the side while I was working as an engineer now doing these projects. And so I got the groundwork for it and everything like that. And I remember I'd go into work at um, usually around eight or nine. So I would wake up at like 5.30 in the morning. I would do some work on my marketing agency for about two and a half hours or so. And then I would go into work a little later on 8.30 or 9.00. And a lot of my coworkers would be like, oh, you know, they, they kind of just thought I'd like slept, sleep in and just come to work later because they would get to work usually 7.38. But really, you know, I never even mentioned much to them that I was actually working on another business before my main job and then work throughout the day and then come back home and then work on the marketing agency some more, just trying to get more leads, reaching out to people, going into different Facebook groups, going into different Discord groups, trying to like rummage up clients and get work going for the agency. And then as things started to like get some traction and go, um, I actually had a house that I, uh, mortgage rates were at the all time low. And so I realized that an FHA loan, only three and a half percent down and like mortgage rates were down at like, I was able to get like a two and a half percent interest rate fixed for 30 years on a house. I was like, this opportunity just seems like too, too good to like turn down. So I ended up getting a property, getting a house that was about 30, 45 minutes out of town, but it was in, as a nice spot. And, uh, so I was obviously living out of there and basically during the process of working and, and realizing this marketing agency was starting to scale a little bit, I started to learn a bit about Airbnb as a model. And I thought, okay, like I would really love to go to conferences so that I can meet more of these companies that are in this space that I'm trying to sell my marketing agency services to. And um, I need to think about how I can start to do this more because I went to one conference and it was amazing. I took some time off work to go and I was like, I just want to do this more and like really enjoyed, like I, like you mentioned, the traveling. And so basically I spent about five months and the house was actually a relatively new house that was built in 2020. But I wanted to make it into like a retreat type space more because it was 45 minutes out of town. So I had to do something to draw people out there so that they would book my place um, as an Airbnb. And so I ended up uh, starting a business, uh, um, an LLC. I got two credit cards uh, connected to that LLC that both had a $10,000 limit. So I had $20,000 of 0% interest business uh, credit cards for a year. And what I did with that money was I bought new furniture. I bought a hot tub, I bought a sauna, and basically a lot of interior design type stuff. You should have seen a picture of my house at one point. It was just boxes everywhere. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, I remodeled the whole house, um, put the hot tub in, put the sauna in, got it all looking real nice, got a professional photographer in to take really great photos of it, um, and then listed on Airbnb and basically packed my life into a suitcase and started going from conference to conference, all in the Web3 space, in the crypto space. And sure enough, the bookings started rolling in. And they came in one after the other, one after the other. And I had a cleaner that I would directly message in a group, in a, in a text, basically. And I managed the whole thing myself remotely, just by messaging the cleaner. So and so is checked out. You know, you can go to clean you know, and then send her the payment for cleaning and, and whatnot. And yeah, lots of learnings, lots of uh, lessons from that business as well. But it was just amazing that it able to fund me to start traveling to these different conferences and meeting more people. That's awesome. Well, it sounds like uh, definitely some uh, great opportunities that came up as uh, you're kind of uh, pursuing things on uh, both ends. So so now kind of with all of that as a background, catch us, uh, catch us up a bit as to where things at today. I think you're still doing the Airbnb and spark focusing on the marketing agency and pursuing the, the different passions, but walk us through a bit as to kind of what you have going on today and uh, where things are at for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so like I mentioned with the travel and whatnot, at some of these conferences, I met another entrepreneur who had a freelance business building communities and he was building these online digital communities, mostly on discord. And he's really, really good at it. It was amazing when he showed me what he could do. I was just kind of blown away. 
And I really liked the aspect that came to building communities. And so I was starting to get a little bit burnt out on, on some of the same PR packages and marketing side, side of things that I was doing. And I wasn't really able to really scale that up. And the market took a really large downturn as well. So there was a lot less money, a lot less companies spending money on those services. And so I was kind of looking to see what would be something else I could kind of get into. And we just really hit it off with each other. And so we ended up forming a partnership with another group of two guys out of England as well. And we ended up actually after through lots of online meetings and everything, moving in together into a farmhouse in Portugal and so I lived in Portugal for about five or six months this year. And during that whole time I was there, I was managing my Airbnb back in the U.S. I actually brought in a co-host to help me because the time zone shift was tough. People would be checking in at 6, 7 p.m. And it's like 1 a.m. my time, you know, just north of Lisbon. And so that was a bit of a juggle um, earlier this year for sure. But uh, got back on the conference circuit. I'm actually back in the U.S. right now. I'm headed to an event, um, a longer event with a bunch of other entrepreneurial founders in Costa Rica in a few weeks, which would be great. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited for that. But, yeah, we've, we've pivoted more to building communities for traditional brands. Um, we actually did a rebrand as well. Uh, we've rebranded from the Discord Gurus, which was focused a lot on building Discord servers and everything. And we're now called CoUnity which is basically thinking about the definition of community is a mix between kind of thought between common and unity. So it's kind of a bit of a play on the words co-unity. And I really see a lot of value. I'm pretty bullish, I guess you could say, on the value of a, that a community can build for companies and brands in the future here. You know, I mean, looking at some of these statistics on customer acquisition costs right now, We've got privacy laws with GDPR um, and just like this aspect of more and more people in the digital world now. So like the, the digital cities are getting busier. When you go on the internet, there's more billboards and advertisements popping up. And so it's a race to the bottom in a certain sense for some of these agencies doing the advertising. And as a result, your customer acquisition cost is increasing quite a bit right now. It's much more expensive than it used to be. I think the e-commerce stats are it's up about 222% in the last eight years. And so as a result, it's like, how could we potentially look more at that aspect of retention over acquisition? Like it's such, it's so much more valuable to make sure your customers don't leave if it gets that much more expensive to acquire new ones. And that's where I think the customer service comes into a big part for companies. And I've seen these communities that have been launched where you make these diehard, awesome, communities for people and they become an amazing customer service avenue people ask questions in the community and so how do we build these communities that foster a space where people are comfortable to answer questions and contribute become ambassadors really like lots of you know word of mouth referral aspects even contributing content and just like sharing a similar passion like a common unity for for people and so building out these systems now and partnering with like different AI tools that have come out to help build communities, all this different type of thing. So we're kind of on the cutting edge now of helping digital communities. So it's been a really fun space to kind of innovate in. Um, and yeah, the Airbnb business has been going really great. I got super host in my first quarter, which is great. You have to be above a 4.8 review and have a certain amount of stays. And uh, I've been maintaining that. I'm up to a 4.9 right now. And it's just, it's great to have all the reviews come in and hear people's experiences that they've had such a great time there and it was relaxing and rejuvenating exactly what I was kind of designing it to be. So, and like you said, you know, as I'm in this startup space, I guess you could say getting this agency going, that's been funding a lot of my travel and a lot of my, you know, different expenses as I kind of go from place to place. So yeah, it's been, it's been quite a wild ride recently but uh things really feel like starting to level out a little bit things are starting to scale with the agency we've just signed an actually another client yesterday which is awesome and yeah i'm pretty excited for working on it some more and st starting to partner more with some of these product tools in the ai space We're really getting kind of deeper leveraging that technology it just blows my mind um the deeper i get into it i'm sure you've probably talked to quite a few people about it and and startups about it so but yeah, no, it's been really interesting. 
No, it sounds like uh, definitely an awesome journey, a fun place to be, and uh, lots of uh, opportunity, uh, <laughs> excuse me, yet to come. So awesome. Well, now as we've kind of reached the, the present day of your journey and kind of hearing a little bit about even where things are uh, headed, a uh, great time to transition to the two questions I always like to ask at the end of each episode. So let's uh, jump to those now. So mm -hmm. the first question I'd like to ask is, along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? What'd you learn from it? I gotcha. I would say maybe a good recent example would be from the Airbnb. And I think um, the lesson around it really was a bad business decision is not really setting up expectations clearly, even when things are kind of like out of your control in certain senses. So I'll give you like the context to this, this example and what the lesson was from it, where basically I had a guest come and stay at my Airbnb and they broke like the leg on the couch, like the couch broke basically. Right. Mm. And the next guest was checking in the next day and I didn't basically I mean, it was a mistake. I didn't message them about the broken couch that the couch, one couch leg was broken. And, and they basically had a review uh, on their feedback saying like, Hey, you know, it was kind of uh, the couch was broken. That was kind of like, you know, frustrating, blah, blah, blah. You know, they were upset by the fact that the couch was broken. And then that had another guest checking in the very, very next day. It was like back to backs and I didn't have anyone to go out and fix the couch in between and so the next guest that came i just instantly sent out a message saying like hey just want to really give you a heads up like the back left leg of the couch is broken it tips or whatever really just wanted to let you know so that you're aware of it and um and whatnot i had a, some rowdy guest day like that were before you right and he instantly was like oh thank you so much for the heads up really appreciate it you know blah blah and then just that like in itself as an example, you know, setting expectation, you know, the, the couch leg was broken. I told him it was broken. You know, it's a, it's a tiny little small micro example, but you can see how it can scale to things when that aspect of like, if there's something that's not quite right, that you know, isn't quite right, being upfront, honest about it and setting that expectation just really sets you apart. I think in, in that genuine aspect and professional kind of business acumen. So that was, that was definitely a lesson I learned more. So on like, if I can warn anyone about anything or just keep them over communicated and set that expectation of what they're receiving, uh, it comes across much better. No, I, I definitely think that, you know, said, and sometimes it's easy to think, oh, I'm not going to worry about it. It's easy to, you know, it's not that big of a deal. And to you, it's not, you know, it's, hey, these things happen, but it's in the works of getting fixed. And yet when you're on the customer end, you know, those small things can uh, certainly be impactful. And if it's communicated to you, then it helps to set those expectations. And if it's not communicated, then uh, oftentimes it leads to, you know, to misconceptions. And so I think that's a, certainly an easy mistake to make, but a, a great one to learn from. Second question now that I'd like to ask you. So now if you're talking to somebody that's uh, just getting into a startup or a small business, what would be the one piece of advice you give them? I would say my one piece of advice is very much related to the way that I've kind of done things as well and it comes to this aspect of being an ever learning student I guess you could say as you're building things I think that would be a huge piece of advice and what that relates to is like what are the major books in my field or in this industry what are the different webinars that I can kind of attend what are the different YouTube videos I can educate myself like I'm almost constantly uh, I mean I even went through a, a phase actually of a, of a year a full a year and a bit where I actually didn't watch any movies or TV shows. It was all documentaries. It was all YouTube educational content. My YouTube hours have got to be crazy. Like the amount of like, educational content on YouTube is insane. And so like just to be able to constantly be updating and improving yourself uh, as an ever learning student, despite being have already graduated, I honestly feel like I've learned more relevant things from my own personal education trends i'm sure i definitely learned a lot of strategies and things of course from my time in college as well but the specific aspects of things that i'm building now so much so i've been heavily re revolved around educating myself i mean the other amazing place for teaching yourself things is using chat gpt and ai you can have it break down things for you you can ask it to give you an analogy of things there's certain complex prompts that can give summaries of multiple articles and give you new insights and things like that 
And so, you know, these AI tools at our fingertips for education, as well as just the amount of creators out there giving more value to kind of boost their products and services, the content, the quality of it that's coming out is 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 so high right now. You can very easily find so much free resources to level yourself up. So I would say just that continual aspect of of leveling yourself up and improving yourself, constantly being a ever learning student is the biggest piece of advice I think will help you um, move faster in, in your journey for sure. No, I think that's uh, definitely a great, and I love the ability to have kind of that uh, constant learning attitude and what, wh or whatever means, whether it's YouTube, whether it's audiobooks, podcasts, you know, hard, your hardback books, webinars, seminars, live person, whatever it might be. I think having that ability to continue to learn and uh, helps you to keep apprised of what's going on in the industry and also often leads to uh, new innovations or new ideas or ways to approach things uh, differently and uh, to continue to improve the business. So I think that's definitely a, a great uh, piece of advice and a great takeaway. Well, now as uh, we wrap up uh, the episode, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? Sure. Um, the website for the community building agency is just counity.xyz. And there's a there's a contact us uh, form there. And for reaching out to me with anything, questions, comments, et cetera, or even specific digital community questions, anything in my story, I'm always happy uh, to, to chat with people. I My username on almost all platforms is just the, T-H-E, the Dan Rodman. D-A-N-R-O-D-M-A-N. So that's on, on Instagram, on Telegram, on Twitter, um, and uh, even on like the extensions through on, on LinkedIn, you can search me through that as well. So yeah, happy to have conversations with anybody in their entrepreneurial journey. Um, and of course, with services related to building digital communities for your company, for your brand, as you scale and you get to that point, if you want to look at retention more, we are all about that data-driven, all sorts of strategies, insights, and even getting into the different technologies that are cutting edge right now to kind of level you up too. So yeah, definitely happy to, to chat with anyone. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage uh, people to reach out, uh, connect, uh, support a great business, and uh, if nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again uh, for uh, coming on the podcast. And uh, with that, um, you know, if uh, now uh, for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to share and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So let's go to inventiveguest.com. Apply to be on the show. A couple more things as listeners. Make sure to click share, subscribe, leave us a review. Helps us to reach even more startups and small businesses uh, to help them along their journey to success. And on that note, if you ever need help along your journey with your uh, with uh, patents or trademarks or anything else for your startup or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Well, thank you again, Dan, for coming on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Awesome. Appreciate it, Devin. Thanks for having me.